On August 4th of 1972, a coronal mass ejection exploded out of the sun at 2,800 kilometers per second. The solar wind and particle bombardment that traveled out across the solar system was so intense that it swept aside cosmic rays that usually arrive from outside of the galaxy and temporarily shredded half of the northern hemisphere's ozone layer. Geomagnetic storms ravaged hydroelectric plants, nuclear detonation satellites fired false alarms, and dozens of American magnetic sea mines off the coast of Vietnam spontaneously detonated. But for any astronaut caught in the cosmic blast, the radiation levels alone would have likely been a death sentence. If our ambition as a species is to travel out among the stars, how do we replicate the magnetic shield of Earth to protect ourselves from the cosmic radiation storms capable of pulling apart our DNA at the seams? Can we really build an effective deflector shield? I love finding places where sci-fi meets reality and understanding just how feasible actually engineering these systems might be. It turns out we've actually been exploring the concept since the early 1960s, and today we are very close to working out a scaled down version of a system. There are two types that I want to talk about today, magnetic and electrostatic deflection systems. And now, as always, I like to start simple. So today is particle physics. Explain particle physics to a particle. There are two primary sources of radiation out in the vacuum of space. The first is solar particle events, or SPEs, that primarily contain protons, with energies typically ranging from a few megaelectron volts to a few hundred megaelectron volts. These are emitted during phenomena like solar flares or coronal mass ejections that we've covered in previous videos, like how one day they might destroy the internet. The unit of interest here is the electron volt, and it's a measure of the kinetic energy gained by an electron when accelerating by electrodes with one volt potential difference between them. Now, protons are more massive, but still gain one electron volt of energy between these two electrons. They just move slower, as kinetic energy is mass times the velocity squared. A proton with one mega electron volt of kinetic energy has a speed of about 13.8 million meters per second, or about 4% the speed of light. A proton with 100 mega electron volts, though, of kinetic energy has a speed of about 129 million meters per second, or 40 33% the speed of light. If we want to stop a particle with 100 mega electron volts in its tracks, we need to absorb that energy by applying a massive decelerating force. And actually, although 43% of the speed of light sounds fast, these particles are comparatively, when it comes to grand space terms, low energy. But they do come in very large numbers during things like solar particle events. As a result, astronauts typically avoid them either by shielding using materials that can absorb or deflect incoming radiation, such as in spacecraft holes, or just by timings, planning missions to minimize exposure, such as avoiding solar maximum periods when SPEs are more frequent. The second major type of dangerous particles are galactic cosmic rays, or GCRs. These are high energy particles originating from outside of our solar system, believed to be produced by supernova, active galactic nuclei, and neutron stars. Galactic cosmic rays consist of a mixture of high energy protons, about 85%, alpha particles, about 14%, and a small fraction of heavier nuclei, including things like iron. These are collectively known as HZE ions for high H charge, Z just to confuse you, and E for energy, nuclei. The energy ranges of these GCRs are extremely broad, extending from about 100 mega electron volts to over 3 exa electron volts for the Oh My God particle detected in 1991. The Oh My God particle was assumed to be a proton and it was calculated that it had the same kinetic energy as a baseball traveling at 100 kilometers per hour. But as the Oh My God particle was a fundamental particle, a proton, it was smaller and less massive than a baseball, meaning that it had to have a velocity significantly faster to have the same kinetic energy. It was calculated that it was moving at about 99.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
As a result, a different approach to protecting deep space travelers is needed, and as of the 1960s, NASA started to explore multiple approaches to what it refers to as active shielding concepts, a force field capable of shielding spacecraft and their inhabitants from the violent particle storms of space. The basic principle behind an active shield for protecting spacecraft and astronauts from space radiation starts with the observation that a large majority of high-speed particles are charged, and as a result, if these particles encounter a magnetic or electrostatic barrier as they hurtle their way through space, these fields will apply a repulsive or deflecting force to these particles and so reduce their potential for harmful impact on humans and sensitive equipment. We said before, if we want to stop a particle in its tracks, we need to remove its kinetic energy. Taking an electrostatic static approach, this would mean that to stop a proton flying through the galaxy with an energy of 200 mega electron volts, we would need two electrodes with 200 mega volts between them. To put that in context, 200 million volts is comparable to the voltage delivered in lightning, and at the moment that's far beyond what we can actually produce even with things like old school atom smashers. The record achieved was about 32 mega volts. Because of this, most scientific teams were quick to write off electrostatic approaches due to the exceptionally high voltage requirements for these systems, so as a result magnetic deflection mechanisms became the primary focus of spaceflight groups around the world. The active radiation shield for space exploration missions, which if you say with an American accent sounds like awesome, but if you say with a British accent sounds like arse M, this approach was established in 2002 by the European Space Agency, so I think they were intending on the latter pronunciation with the help of CERN. In their proposal, they wanted to develop on CERN's expertise in high power superconducting magnetic field creation to produce a device capable of shielding deep space missions. Their ideal design looked a lot like a miniature version of the Atlas experiment, which sets the record for the largest magnet in the world at 26 meters long and 20 meters in diameter for the four superconducting coil assemblies, with an internal volume through which usually passes a high energy particle beam collision experiment, but in their proposed designs would house instead a deep space exploration team, potentially for many years at a time. This exceptionally high magnetic field produced by the device would divert incoming high-speed particles, protecting the crew aboard. Some studies and simulations that I found suggest that magnetic shielding could reduce exposure to galactic cosmic rays by approximately 30 to 50% for missions outside of Earth's magnetosphere such as trips to Mars. But with this came a few problems. As most people that have been on the internet for the past couple of years are aware, superconductors are actually quite hard to work with. They usually work at very low temperatures, which is why each time someone announces they have come up with a room temperature superconductor, everyone on the internet loses their mind. One of the big problems of superconductors in space is that most require active and continuous cooling, usually in the form of something like evaporative liquid helium, which requires periodic resupplies of that helium to continue working, which isn't an easy problem to solve if you are sending a probe into deep space. The other problem is power draw. Even with these superconductors, these systems draw huge power requirements for Atlas, tens of thousands of amps flowing through the coils, which at the moment we aren't very good at dealing with in space as most systems rely on either solar panels or nuclear thermal batteries, though we did look quite recently at teams looking to put micronuclear reactors on the moon in the next decade. Alternative materials like Rebco, a high temperature superconductor, are capable of operating at liquid nitrogen boiling temperatures rather than helium and as a result are much easier to work with. Building on this idea, the European Space Agency developed the EVA and larger SR2S, the Space Radiation Superconducting Shield, which sadly followed a similar fate as its predecessor, but focused on the design and testing of superconducting coils capable of generating the magnetic field required for effective radiation deflection. The magnets that they required needed to be lightweight, energy efficient, and capable of operating in the harsh conditions of space. The end result that they proposed looked something like this a toroidal magnet protecting a small human habitat with propulsion systems in the rear. The magnetic force it could produce was calculated to be around 12 tesla per meter, but to support the system heavy structural beams were required, weighing in about 100 tons of material in total. These supports would not be entirely protected by the magnetic fields, which brings us to a problem we talked about earlier. As a result, if high energy particles hit these structures, they produce a cascade of secondary particles, turning one damaging particle into a shotgun blast of radiation. The conclusion 
conclusion of this proposal was that increasing shielding power alone was one thing, but it was useless if it wasn't coupled with an appropriate choice of material and structural design in order to limit the generation of secondary particles. So the aim changed to produce a design that minimized support structures, weight, and chances of secondary decay. The final design of the SR2S was the pumpkin, which involved arranging superconducting coils in a way that creates a toroidal or donut-shaped magnetic field around the spacecraft. This design allowed it to provide a uniform and adequate magnetic field coverage around the inhabited areas and null or minimal at least magnetic field inside the habitat so it didn't damage the sensitive equipment. The term for a design that achieved very low secondary particle generation was radiation transparent and this was a very good approach to initial designs but it still remained four to six times the mass of the rest of the module and that would require multiple launches and then assembly in orbit and ultimately an appropriate cooling system was never actually identified, so it still remained an untested design on the drawing boards. It wasn't until 2022 that we saw the lowest weight version of superconducting rings in the Cosmic Radiation Extended Warding Halbach Taurus, or the Crew Hat, as if that name makes more sense. The Halbach Array is a special arrangement of magnets that amplifies the field on one side of the array while cancelling it out on the other side, and it's often used in conjunction with superconducting magnets. This property makes Halbach Arrays particularly useful in applications where a concentrated magnetic field is required in a specific area area or direction, like on magnetic levitation trains. Each semi-elliptical array faced either directly outwards or perpendicular to the crew quarters, producing an enhanced external magnetic field that diverts cosmic radiation particles, while producing close to no magnetic field components in the astronaut's habitat. Simulations showed that it was capable of diverting about 50% of cosmic rays below 1 giga electron volt in energy. And according to NASA, this is sufficient to reduce radiation dose absorbed by astronauts to a level that is less than 5% of the lifetime excess risk of cancer mortality levels. If this system was then combined with conventional passive shielding, it could offer a total shielding of about 70% to galactic cosmic rays, and the design was one of the lightest ever proposed, weighing in at a mere 25 tons. However, with all close approximations come catches. The energy to power this system would have equated to the full power supply capability of the ISS, around 60 kilowatts, which just can't be supported by current spacecraft, so this design still remains difficult to deploy on missions. This felt frustratingly like the final dead end, but recently a fundamentally different approach has started to shine, one previously written off long ago. As cosmic rays tend to be protons which have positive charge, they can be deflected by other charged objects. We started this conversation with the idea of the electron volt as the kinetic energy gained by an electron or proton when accelerated by electrodes with one volt of potential difference, and that for high-speed charged particles, stopping them with electrostatics was impossible because of the voltages required. But if we just want to divert a particle, this requires significantly less energy. This was the view of Stojan Madzunkov's team at JPL and Dan and Fry's team at NASA's Johnson Space Center. For them, previous attempts gave up too early without any conclusive tests. Instead, they were going to tackle the issues head on to get closer to an answer. The simplest shielding setup possible would be a dipole with a positively and negatively charged electrode. This is the starting point the research team began with for their particle deflection equivalent of a wind tunnel experiment. They built a system capable of scanning a beam of protons past an electrode pair that would then strike a phosphor screen that could record the impact point of the beam. When no voltage was applied to the system, only the shadows of the electrodes are visible. But as the voltage was increased, the charged protons began to be deflected from passing between the electrodes, creating a shield of protection for, in this case, any teeny tiny astronauts behind the array. Madzunkov and Fry knew they needed to make an assessment of thousands of possible designs, so they wrote an entire code package called the Active Shielding Particle Pusher, designed to use modern GPUs to their limits, which let them simulate over 10,000 designs over a two-year period of research. They found that grid-shaped structures were particularly promising and reasonably underexplored, and offered the tantalizing possibility of using far lower voltages to provide shielding effects. If these designs could be scaled up and 
tiled to form a large mesh cage enclosing the entire spacecraft, then cosmic rays would be deflected in a somewhat reminiscent version of a Faraday cage. Simulation is one thing though, experimental testing was still required, particularly as complex effects such as plasma interactions are possible with high electric fields. The best way to test this setup might have been to build a shielding system and lower it into a beam line at somewhere like the Large Hadron Collider to measure its particle deflection capabilities. However, as particle accelerators require a near-perfect vacuum to accelerate particles, and vacuum chambers and particle beams just don't come in the dimensions sufficiently large for testing, a full-size model of this approach isn't feasible. Instead, scaled-down models would be needed, which sounds simple until you remember that physics often doesn't like to scale. And that's true, yes, of quantum into general relativity, and they don't play nicely with each other, but it's also relevant for simpler physics. A human-sized ant would be so heavy its legs simply couldn't support it, and that's because volume increases by the third power, but cross-section increases by the squared power. Once the fundamentals of the system were understood, a stacked cage-like version of the design was constructed with negative electrodes at the corners and positive electrodes in the center. This was placed into a larger vacuum system with a particle accelerator firing two mega electron volt protons. By charging the system to just 50 kilovolts, it gave a detected shadow on the phosphor screen that looked like this. We can use the shadowed areas in this image as a proxy for shielding efficacy, kind of like chainmail shielding. We aren't looking at perfect uniform coverage, but about 50% blocking capability. And although these experiments were performed with lower energy two mega electron protons, the scaling work conducted by the team confirms it should be possible to block 50% of 200 mega electron volt protons with a comparatively low one megavolt. Beyond this initial result, two layers of this system could then be stacked and offset to improve the shielding capabilities of the system and plug the gaps. But even with this design as it stands, a 50% reduction in high speed cosmic rays means that missions that are radiation exposure time limited can be extended to twice their operational lifetime, essential for future Mars and deep space missions. Also, this approach doesn't require superconducting level cooling for magnetic approaches, or the heavy structural members to support the powerful magnetic fields generated. This, as a result, removes the majority of the weight, launch costs, and probability of secondary radiation cascades that limited the magnetic field approach. But the biggest breakthrough here is that it conclusively demonstrates that high energy particles can be deflected at relatively low voltages, transforming electrostatic deflection from an abandoned fringe approach into a potential front runner in this field. The next steps for this team are to continue to optimize, simulate, and test their 3D designs. It'll be an exciting field to watch for the next few years, and we may, sooner than expected, be capable of venturing out among the stars, protected by a deflection shield pulled straight out of science fiction. If you enjoyed this video, I have a deeper dive on the most powerful particle ever measured, the Oh My God particle and its recently discovered cousin, which you can find here or wherever I left it. Check it out. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next week. Goodbye.